Hi there, Jim here with Fantasy for the Ages, the father of this father and son duo who bring you this show on a regular basis. I'm here today with another rapid review. So in 10 minutes or less, I'm going to be talking about Buzzard's Bowl, book two in The Tragedy of Sedane by John Palladino. Rapid review means there will be spoilers here. I'm not going to tell you everything about the story. You got to read to get all of that goodness. But I am going to go into plot. I'm going to go into characters. If you don't want any spoilers, this is not the episode for you. You should go check out my book blast, which is just a reaction video. It's spoiler light, practically spoiler free. So go check out the book blast on Buzzard's Bowl. After you've read the book, then come on back. If spoilers don't bother you too much, stick around here right now and let's get into this. I will point out, of course, if you like this episode, please do us the honor of hitting the like button and consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss all the things we keep bringing to you related to fantasy, science fiction, and other nerdy stuff my son and I like talking about, as well as with guests from time to time. So this book, oh, man, it is so good. This story is a direct continuation of what we experienced in book one, The Trials of Ashmount. There's no time jump, no significant shift. The story just continues. And that works well because things had gotten rather intense and some big reveals right at the end of book one and inquiring minds want to know what's next. Well, we don't have to figure out and put pieces together we're just going to go straight on. And we're like, yay, that's what we wanted. The Magic High School at Ashmount was blown to smithereens at the end of book one. One thing we see in this book is that this was just the first step of a greater plan to reset the world. It was already made clear to we readers that the Magic High at Ashmount, they were not good people that there was some deliberate manipulation going on so that the haves have more and hang on to it, and the peons are kept in line. Now we see and get confirmation of this group of rogue magic users, the Elkovich. They were rumored in book one, and then we met kind of confirmation that, yes, they're real right at the very end. Now we see much more of this group and that they are ready to execute their master plan to set the world right. And that plan means a lot more explosions. It's crazy, man. We also get to see how the news of Ashmount's destruction is impacting the nations of Sedane. Magic Eye play a key role in the power bases of the various nations. And previously, while a valued commodity, they were not necessarily a fossil fuel there were always going to be more magic eye coming out into the world. But now, with no school for training, is this the last of the magic eye supply? People are wondering. So as word spreads of Ashmount's destruction, the actions of the ruling powers, and even the behavior of the magic eye themselves, clearly shifts. We get to see in this book what's next for various characters who were key to the story in book one. But now we get to see how their various plot lines merge, crisscross, even intermingle. Sir Saradel of Cyric finds herself thrust into a position of authority and leadership in this book, something she never strove for, yet her character and personal motivations lead her to step up to the plate and play her part. That part, oh, it becomes stronger and darker in this book, much more so than you would have imagined. We see Vilik the Imbuer stumbling his way through battles and interactions with people, both within the Camel Clans and the nations that they are encountering. Vilik remains an unusual sort of character, someone we'd likely describe in our own world as either cripplingly introverted or even highly functioning autistic. His way of interacting with the world around him ends up allowing him to build bridges between peoples, and even to step up and take actions that others might have been too inhibited to try, as they, you know, are concerned about how others will react or what they're thinking. And Villick is just in his own little world most of the time, so that doesn't come into play. 
I mean, he does have to contend with Speaker still in his head, but he has a penchant for ignoring Speaker anyways. When you are so caught up in your own head, again, you're not necessarily attuned to how things are going on around you. This leads Vilek to just act at times, key times in this story, and the results are profound. We get to see Vilek's steady and constant companion, Dunecrest, play a greater role in this story, especially near the end of the book. His story arc will have a profound impact on Vilek, but I'm going to make you read to see what I mean. Of course, we get to see what Demry Slarn's pursuit of revenge leads him to into this book, with his steady companion Caius at his side still. Demry, left crippled for years after the initial escape from the school at Ashmount, was actually made magically whole again by the end of the first book. Alas, Grimdark, this is not to last. And how he returns to a crippled form is most cruel and unjust. You can't really like Demry as a character, but when you see how those act around him, you can't help rooting for him a bit, at least. I mean, some of those people, they just gotta die. If only Demry would limit himself to killing those who have it coming, instead of everyone and anyone who he somehow can justify acting upon for whatever reason. In this book, we get to see Demry rise high, fall low, rise up again, and end up not too far from where he started in terms of life circumstance. More to come in book three. And of course, we must talk about Edelbrock. His journey is perhaps the most profound of this story. From early on in book one, he was literally screwed. Anything that could go wrong did. Mind you, he had made some poor choices, decisions for which he ought to have to pay, but what we see him endure as a gladiator of Buzzard's Bowl is quite literally going overboard. We do eventually see Edelbrock get into a better context in this book with more options before him. And unfortunately, we find that his suffering has not truly improved him as a person. Rather, it's hardened him. And though he may regret his actions, he still doesn't shirk from making an egregious, horrific decision late in the book that there will be no coming back from. Dude is pretty much damned now. But more still to come for him as well. I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight three other significant points that I picked up on. There is something bigger going on in this story as nations do battle, and I don't think we know the end game yet. We saw Calvarum take out Surik in the, in the previous book. This time we see the Vessians take out the Remarians with the help of the remnant of the Soroki Knights, only to see them all join forces against the bigger bad, the Calrites. You know, those people from Calrim. Yet, when this battle comes to a conclusion, it leaves us wondering, what's next? Will it just be dealing with the explosive Elkovich plan, or is there something else? Some other catastrophic circumstance about to drop. I have suspicions. Demry reconnects in this book with his love from his youth, Myri. Ran into her right at the end of the last book, but that's a plot line throughout this book. And while starting off well, doesn't end so. But there are hints. There is more going on than what appears obvious. And though Demry's kind of blind to that, we readers are not. I'm curious and interested. We definitely have more to learn about this in book three. Finally, we get a great one-book story here in the story of Ashen, Talus, and Jasperd. This is perhaps the truest element of Grimdark in this entire novel. I believe the author mostly included the section to hurt us. It works. Great story. I 100% endorse it. If you haven't read it yet, go get the book and read it. Pre-ordering is available now. It's available to everyone June 1st. But you must read The Trials of Ashmount first for this to make any sense at all. So take the time to do that now. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the book. And we'll talk to you next time.